Hello booktube and welcome to another weekly reading vlog. I don't really have that much to report on this week. I'm uh, still working, working my way through The Odyssey and The Peloponnesian War by Donald Kagan. Uh, I'll start with The Peloponnesian War by Donald Kagan first. Not, not a great week uh, for this one. I, I only got 10 pages read. Um, yeah, th this book, it's, um, it's both interesting and it's not interesting. Uh, it, 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 it's this long war between Athens and Sparta in which there are various campaigns in various cities, uh, and it does have kind of a feeling of just, then the army went to this place, then the army went to this place, and then the army went to this place, just a feeling of just kind of going on and on without really learning much that enriches you uh, in daily life. Uh, and yet, uh, one of the interesting themes that's coming through in this book, I, I, I think I mentioned in a previous video that, that the Peloponnesian War is often compared with the Cold War in the sense that there are two ideologically opposed uh, powers fighting for world domination. W world, in this case, meaning the known world to the Greeks. Uh, and it, it is interesting how in every city there's a democratic faction which wants to align with Athens and an oligarchic faction which wants to align with Sparta. Uh, so there is definitely an ideological component to this war. It, I mean, it, one of the things I wonder about is like, why did, why did the Democrats always want to align with Athens? I mean, is it purely ideology? You, you know, even though they're Democrats, maybe they could get like a better deal from Sparta. Uh, the Democrats with a small d. Uh, not not Democrats like in the modern Democratic Party. I, I, I don't need to clarify that, do I? Uh, anyways, uh, I, I, I regret I didn't read more of this book. It, it, it wasn't a great week for me in terms of my reading, and, and now I'm getting distracted by another book. I, I'm, I'm still finding this interesting as far as it goes. Donald Kagan writes in clear, understandable prose. It, it's, it's all right. And then The Odyssey. So uh, this week... I read from page uh, 116 to 168 in this edition, and I'm getting into the good stuff now. So it, uh, as I mentioned last week, this this book has like a slow start. Uh, it, it starts with Telemachus, uh, Odysseus's son, journeying to different places to get news of him, and then we cut to Odysseus near the end of his voyage, and he goes and he's with the Phaeacians, I think is how that's pronounced, uh, and meeting them, and just a lot of passages about hospitality in the ancient world, how guests need to be fed and given wine and, and all these rituals. But, you know, the classic adventure stuff that you associate with the Odyssey takes a while to kick in. It's not until, well, about page 116, uh, 116 pages into the book, that we finally get to Odysseus's giving his backstory. So, you know, the, it's like one long flashback. Uh, and the parts I've read this week are a lot of the classic parts you associate with the Odyssey, the uh, Cyclops, uh, Circe, um, and I'm just now in the section where Odysseus goes into the land of the dead. In addition to those very well-known parts, there are some few lesser-known parts I completely forgot about. Um, there's a, after the Cyclops, they run into this other land of giants. <sighs> Sorry, I, I forgot to bookmark <laughs> this stuff before I started filming. Uh, I forget what the other names of the giants are. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they land, they, they think they're going to go there for food, and then the, the giants start eating them and they run back to their ships 
and the the giants are throwing like uh, spear fishing them almost throwing the spears and then reeling them in from their ships uh, and it sounds like I think just Odysseus and one of his ships escapes uh, the other ones get eaten by the, the giants or get caught uh, there so that that's one of those areas uh, I completely forgotten about uh, another little thing I had completely forgotten about um, from the last time I read this book, way back when, where was it? Odysseus, at the beginning of his backstory, when, when he's, uh, just talking about all the stuff that happens to him. Oh, uh, yeah. So they're, they're, they're from, they're, they're sailing from Troy. And he said, from Ilion, which means Troy. Uh, the wind served me to near Ismarus of the Sassonis. Sassonis or Sicones, maybe. Uh, I sacked the city and slew them. Their wives and wealth we took and divided precisely so that none of us through me should go short of his just share. So th there's just this little thing there where he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, after we left Troy, we came upon this other city, killed them all, uh, took their women into slavery. And uh, it's, I, I mean, on the one hand, I, I did kind of know that these passages were part of the Trojan War saga. So th this is something I, I've... Didn't fully clue into when I was younger, I think, but but have, have begun to realize this more recently. Uh, in addition to the big, long siege of Troy, there are all these numerous smaller cities that were getting sacked by the Greeks throughout this time. And, uh, it, it, I mean, it's alluded to in the Iliad. I think it's alluded to in other works. And then it, here it is in the Odyssey. Um... You know, at least with the, the 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 sack of Troy itself is difficult for modern readers, I think, to really understand what's going on. Like, who are we supposed to empathize with here? But then, when when we go into these other, but at, sorry, let me collect my thoughts. At least with the sack of Troy, there's some sort of justification. Like, there's the whole cause of war, Helen of Troy, etc. But when all these smaller cities are getting sacked. Apparently, just because they're there, we're like, okay. Uh, but, you, you know, to a certain extent, you just have to go with it because you're like, oh, oh, okay, this was just the ethos of the time, I guess. If there was a, a weaker city, you sacked it. But then the, the confusing thing is there's this real empathy, I don't want, selective empathy, I guess is, is what I would call it where you're supposed to feel so sorry for Odysseus, who's been separated from his wife for these 10 long years. And there are all these passages where it's describing how miserable Odysseus is and how his men long for home. Uh, and you're like, well, why, why, why am I supposed to feel sorry for you? I, you, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, if, it, if this was just the story about a brutal age with hardened, calloused men who went around doing brutal things. I, I could roll with that. I'm, I mean, I, I'd still have this disconnect uh, as a modern reader, but I could say, oh, okay, th this is the mindset I need to get in to, uh, to go with this story. But if we're supposed to feel so sorry for certain characters with certain things, but then completely just not be empathetic to these other characters. I mean, the, the Iliad was like that to a certain extent, and that was one of the many things that I didn't get around to talking to in my review of the Iliad, I think. But, I mean, Achilles is so whiny all throughout the Iliad. Uh, he's, he's overwhelmed by the death of Patroclus, but he's also incredibly thin-skinned about his honor, and he... he you know, there's there's various points where he's, uh, I mean, one point that sticks out in my mind is when he, he's almost killed by the river god. Dr he's almost drowned by the river god. And he starts crying and he says, 
you know, is, is this going to be my fate to, to drown ingloriously? And you're thinking, well, but what about all those people you just callously killed? I, I mean, I, I, could, I could go along with the story if it was just Achilles the callous killer. But like Achilles the whiny crybaby, I don't know. It, it, you, you get what I'm saying, huh? Uh, I'm in the part now where Odysseus is in the land of Hades and, and meeting with his former comrades. Um, yeah, and that, that part in Hades always struck me as really bizarre because the land of the dead is portrayed as just this miserable place. And it always struck me bizarre that the Greeks portrayed it as this gray and miserable place because... They, they all knew they were going there. Um, so wh wh what kind of worldview is it um, to, to just kind of spend your whole life knowing that after you die, you're just going to this miserable, dark place for all eternity? I mean, it's not, it's not like the Christian hell where they're getting tortured, uh, unimaginable torture. Um, but it is just kind of a dark and gray place uh, where everybody is just kind of gloomy all the time is, is definitely the perception you get. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the Christian worldview where the, the Christian worldview is that there is this hell where people are being unimaginably tormented. But that's that's for other people to go to. The Christian worldview is that you uh, are going to this wonderful heaven. Um, and that obviously is much preferable, um, and yet, of course, has, has been pointed out numerous times, just because it's more pleasant to believe doesn't mean it, it's necessarily true. And in fact, you could, you could make the argument that uh, the more it seems like wish fulfillment, the less likely it is to be true. I'm getting off on this theological tangent, aren't I? Um, okay, a point being, an interesting scene with Odysseus in the underworld, and that's where I'm up to right now. Uh, I'm also continuing to inch my way through the uh, Flash Gordon comic book. Uh, read a few more pages this week. Uh, sorry, it's, it's, been, it's been... My evenings have been busy, so it's been slow going. Uh, in the description down below, I will link to the uh, booktube videos I've watched this past week. Uh, I, I just want to briefly go over them real quick. Um, so I've watched a lot of Steve Donahue this week, uh, both at Steve's main channel, uh, but mostly at uh, CPL Radio Book of the Day featuring Steve Donahue. Um, I, I feel a little bit guilty about this because I should be using this time to watch smaller booktubers, particularly uh, people who in, engage with my channel more and, and kind of return, return some of that engagement. Uh, and yet I, I always find myself watching Steve Donahue. Uh, I, I just find the man very entertaining. Uh, and I, I get a lot of this done at work when I'm uh, doing various formatting things on the computer or just mindless tasks. If I'm feeling a little bit sleepy, I'll have a cup of coffee, put on the headphones and listen to Steve Donahue. And, and I, I find it helps me through that post lunchtime uh, slump. But in terms of uh, smaller booktubers who maybe deserve more attention, but uh, Steve Donahue is wonderful. Check out his channel. I'll, I'll leave a link to all the videos uh, I've watched of, of his below. But there's also Brandon's Bookshelf, who did uh, My Deconversion Story, How I Left Christianity and Became an Atheist. Uh, this is part of his Sunday School series number two. It's 40 minutes long, and when I, I, 
I know I make long rambling videos that are 40 minutes long or longer all the time, but <laughs> when it's somebody else, uh, you kind of think to yourself, okay, am I going to listen to this whole thing or will I just check out the first five minutes of it and see how it goes? But uh, I, I got sucked into it. I, I listened to the whole 40 minutes and found it really fascinating. Uh, I, I come from a broadly similar background myself. And what I mean by broadly similar is I also started out as a Christian believer and have my own deconversion story uh, over some of the same issues that he mentions. And th th these deconversion stories are all over YouTube. And yet, uh, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's good for us to have this community on YouTube because um, my own experience is, you know, when, when I, all my friends from back home are either friends I know from my Christian school background or my, my church background. Um, and most of them, uh, still Christian. Uh, so there, there's a feeling of, of disconnect there. Uh, something that Brandon mentions on his video as well. This, this little thing separating you from your, 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 your friends. Uh, and you have this feeling when you're, when you're just comparing yourself to your group of friends that it's you who are the odd one out. But when you connect with other similarly minded people with a community like YouTube, then, then there's, there's some solidarity in sharing those experiences. So I, I, I think it's good that he's sharing them. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a good story that he's, um, he, he talks about his experiences articulately. Um, so it's, it's good to watch. Uh, William's Library. So William uh, took a hiatus from BookTube. Well, well he was, uh, it sounds like, among other things, upgrading his uh, equipment. But he is back now uh, and uh, watched his video, Garden of the Beasts by Jeffrey Deaver, which I have never heard of before. But it sounds really interesting. Uh, historical fiction about... Uh, American secret agents in Nazi Germany or during the 1930s. Uh, I, I, William said it was the first historical fiction he ever read. Sorry, he didn't say first. But he said he rarely reads historical fiction. Um, I love historical fiction. And so it, get, it gets a point from me right there. And then uh, William made it sound really interesting by talking about all the twists and turns and intrigue in the book. So it, it definitely got my attention. Uh, you know, finding books in Vietnam is always touch and go. But if, if I happen to stumble upon that book in a, in a used bookstore stall out here someday, uh, I, if, I will now make sure to grab it. Uh, and then Jim's from Jim's Books Reading and Stuff, one of his one minute review series. Uh, yeah, you know, Jim's one minute reviews are, of course, the complete opposite of this channel where I go on long uh, rambling reviews, but uh, you know that's that that's good. Uh, my my long rambling reviews are not to be emulated. That's very well. <laughs> P point is, uh, Jim has imposed a discipline on his reviews where he's able to just cut out all the fat, get right down, give a very succinct description of the book within one minute, and it, it sounded like an interesting book, uh, The Inspector in Silence by Hakim Nesser. So I'll, I'll link to all that down in the description below. Be sure to check that out. And uh, that's all for this week. Sorry, one more thing. Uh, just remember this as I was wrapping up. Uh, the next two months, uh, I am going to be busy doing a combination of either hosting hosting guests uh, visiting from back home uh, and also traveling during the uh, Christmas break uh, and then the Vietnamese Lunar New Year which is uh, coming early this year 
usually in February, but it's going to be in January this year. So uh, I, between all of that, it remains to be seen whether I'll be able to keep these weekly reading vlogs on schedule throughout the months of December and January. Uh, so if, if, I, if I happen to miss a week or be late uh, with a week or something like that, that's, that's why. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll do my best to chime in every week, but, it, but if uh, you don't see me one week, that, that'll be why. Okay, I'm, I'm going to finish up here.